Hello, welcome to week three of ter term two. All right, so this week um, we have argument Google Slides part three. And we have a topic bank, which I will explain in a little bit. And as always, if you're viewing this video, it's because you were absent on one of our synchronous days, um, depending on your cohort. So that could be Tuesday, Thursday, or Wednesday, Friday. Um, but this is week three. This is what we have for our argumentative writing, persuasive writing unit. So let's take a second and reflect on what we've learned. I know we had a very long weekend with Thanksgiving break, which I hope was wonderful for you. So let's kind of refresh our memories on what we talked about last week. So this is week three. Week one and week two, the past two weeks, we have obviously started this unit and we looked at the fundamentals of argument and argumentative writing. We covered a lot and we're going to review it right now. So last week we looked at um, what is an argument? How would you define it? Um, we have this visual here and I know this looks very familiar because we reviewed this exact slide last week but what I want you to do is pause this video and I want you to tell me before I tell you what is an argument? How did we define it? What did we say it was? So go ahead and pause this video and go to your slides and write the definition here. And then we will come back to this video and keep going. All right, so you have thought about your definition. We learned that an argument is a group of statements that lead to a conclusion. So this is our visual. We have everything circled as a statement. They can look different and when you put them all together they create an argument. So this is the argument as a whole. And then we also looked at argument versus persuasion. We use the analogy of hot and cold that an argument has to exist first and it's cold because it's passionless. It's just statements that lead to a conclusion, but persuasion is getting somebody to care about that cold argument using certain techniques and tools, which we're going to look at today. It's going to be really fun. And then we also looked at syllogisms. These are the building blocks of any argument. These are our templates um, with all the patterns highlighted showing how you can kind of just break down an argument at its core, and this is what you should see statements that force us to accept a conclusion. And last week, specifically week two, we looked at going beyond three line syllogisms because that was just the starting point. And I want you to fill in the blank here. Syllogisms help us determine an argument's blank. Evidence helps us determine an argument's blank. So go ahead and pause, go back to your slides and fill out this blank. All right, so we learned that syllogisms help us determine an argument's validity, meaning it's logical, it's reasonable, it makes sense just looking at the logic of it, but evidence help, helps us determine an argument's, um, an argument's credibility, meaning is this the best way to argue this point or to persuade someone of this argument? Now, when we looked at evidence last week, this was something I hope you recognize, that with evidence, you should just always prepare for pushback. Why do we need evidence? Why should I put it in my essay or put it in my argument? You have to provide strong evidence because you just have to assume that basically everyone's going to be against your argument or whatever it is that you're trying to persuade, that they have the opposite view. And so if you have really, really solid evidence um, it could be any of those five types. It's just going to make your argument strong and make your persuasion, persuasion the most effective possible. And speaking of, these are our five types of evidence that we looked at last week. Facts, numbers, quotes, examples, and analogies. And like I said last week, you could pick and choose. You don't have to have all of these represented in your argument. But if you do, and they're really, really good um, examples of any of these five types, it's only going to make it stronger. All right, so that was week one and two. Again, that was just the fundamentals of argument, but now we're going to transition for this week, next week, and beyond. 
to persuasion. How do we how do we move from this area of argument, simply simply providing statements that lead to inclusion, to actually getting somebody to care about it? What do, how do we do that? What kind of tools and techniques do we need to know and understand? Well, I'm sure this might look familiar to you. We're gonna do some kind of pre-reflection writing here. I want you to pause and go into the slides and tell me to the best of your ability of what you can remember. Again, don't go to Google, just tell me what you know right now or what you can remember. What is logos, what is pathos, and what is ethos? And then we're gonna talk about it, so go ahead and do that. All right, so you should have your responses down. Thank you for doing that. So let's look, we're gonna um, watch this video. I'm not gonna play it within this video, but you are going to pause this video, go back to your slides and watch it yourself, um, because this is gonna give us a really good overview of rhetoric, which is what ethos, pathos, and logos are a part of. So go ahead and pause this video, go to this link and we'll watch it. All right, so we watched a really good overview and we learned or refreshed our memories that Logos, we're gonna start with here, Logos, uses reason and logic. So this is going to be where you appeal to, like it says on the slide, logic and reason. You have to think about kind of again that syllogism part of argument that what, what just logically makes sense. So what we're gonna do you're going to watch this commercial for T-Mobile. It's like 30 seconds long. And you are going to answer these questions after you watch it. What is the conclusion of this argument? What is the point or the idea they are trying to make? How does this commercial demonstrate logos using reason and logic? What do they do? And what types of evidence are they using? So try to look for, you know, examples, analogies, numbers, um, examples. What was the other one? You can go back to that slide and look at it, but you're going to watch this commercial and then you're going to answer these questions. So go ahead and do that. Okay, so when we watch this, we realize that they're trying to convince us that T-Mobile is the best. They're combining with Verizon and they're going to give you the best uh, social or excuse me, Cell reception. You're going to have the best network. It's going to be, you're, the data is going to be amazing. You're never going to have any problems because they're teaming up with Verizon. That would be their main point, right? So how do, how does this commercial, how does T-Mobile demonstrate logos? What's the logic? You can, your answer here might be very similar to what you put for evidence. So what are they using? Well, we see lots of numbers and lots of facts. Um, numbers and facts are probably going to be the two forms of evidence that are most popular or correlated with logos if you're really trying to make a strong logos appeal. So thank you for doing that. We're going to do that again with pathos. Uh, this commercial is a little bit longer. Pathos is all about empathy and emotions, trying to strike that emotional chord within people because let's face it, no matter how hard we try to hide it, people are emotional beings. We have um, empathy for people or living beings that have either shared similar life experiences, things that are sad, things that are happy. There's this whole pendulum of emotions that we go through as human beings and pathos appeals to that. It brings up connections to sentimental things. Um, so again, you're going to watch this commercial and then you're going to answer the question, what conclusion is in this argument. What is the main idea or point they're trying to make? How does this commercial demonstrate pathos? And then what types of evidence are they using specifically? So go ahead and do that. All right, so what is the conclusion in this argument? It might have taken you to the very end of the commercial to realize what that is. Um, 
Um, I would say that they're trying to make a comparison. It, this whole commercial could be an analogy, which is evidence. They're trying to compare your relationship to a dog, a beloved pet that you have, to a car. That as you grow older, you go through all these big life experiences. Just like your beloved pet, your car is also going to be there for all of these big milestone events. Um, so that could be kind of the conclusion in this argument that there's loyalty, that it's with you through it all. And like I said, analogy, this could be one giant analogy that they're using as evidence. Um, how does this commercial demonstrate pathos? Well, who doesn't love a sweet, gentle puppy, an animal? This definitely appeals to our emotions because even if you haven't ever had a pet yourself, I'm sure you've seen somebody else's or gone to Critter Cabana and seen all the cute little puppies and kittens. So that is pathos. And then we have ethos, ethos, ethics, ethical. This is focusing on the credibility that the writer or expert brings to the argument. So this is probably more similar to logos than pathos, just because it's kind of going to rely on, um, more facts and numbers. But again, you're going to watch this commercial for Kaiser Permanente, and then you are going to answer the same questions. What's the conclusion? How does this commercial demonstrate ethos? And what types of evidence are they using? So go ahead and pause this video and watch the commercial and answer your questions. All right, so this is a very relevant commercial. I'm sure you've seen it on TV. Um, if you haven't, this is on TV everywhere right now. Obviously, it's very um, current to the times of COVID and this pandemic that we're in. So what is the main point in this argument is trying to make? Well, they're trying to um, convince you that you can make it through this pandemic by basically following what they're saying. Wash your hands, stay six feet apart. Don't go out if you're sick. Um, these are doctors and nurses and people that are medical and health career professionals. Um, you could even look at this logo up here, Together We Thrive. That is their slogan, which we're gonna learn about slogans next week. Um, they're trying to say that if you can do these things, if we can do these things, we'll make it through. So how does this demonstrate ethos? How does this demonstrate credibility, ethics? How do we know? Well, every time they show a doctor or a nurse or somebody, it has their credentials right here. Danny, assistant clinical director, he's a, he's a registered nurse. So they're showing you that these people are educated, they are trained in the medical field, they know what they're talking about. They're not just some guy that is on the street, right? Okay, so let's keep going here. In just a few... So we, like I said, weeks one and two, we looked at the foundations of argument, which I would argue is really centered around logos. Logos may get us to the truth, but the goal of all authors and speakers is to convince the audience of truth. So you need to know that argument is really in the real world. It's not enough. You have to really lean hard into persuasion, and that's going to take all three of these to get to that point. So I'm gonna leave you with one question to answer for me, to think about. Out of these three that we just looked at, logos, that's logic, reason, pathos, emotion, empathy, and ethos is that credibility and the ethics. Do you think that one of these three, you can answer this honestly, I'm not looking for a right or wrong answer. Do you think that one of these three is better than the other? Is one greater than another to use in an argument, to use in persuasive writing? You can answer that with a yes or no. And then we will continue on with day two of synchronous learning. All right, welcome to day two. Um, if you were here on day one, you obviously were doing everything live, but this is day two for synchronous learning, week three. So we're gonna do some review. I want you to look at these pictures and try to remember what we talked about on day one. And I want you to write your response. How, how, what is logos, what is pathos, and what is ethos? How did we define it? What is it? Let's go ahead and pause this video and do that.
All right, so logos, if you look at this picture, logic, mathematics, this is um, the aspect of persuas persuasion that relies on logic and reasoning and facts and numbers and things that are very concrete and easy to point to because they are um, not in flux. They are concrete, like I said. Pathos, look at all these emojis. This is about emotions. I know that looking at the P and the E, you might think, oh, ethos, emotions. I start with the same letter. Um, I know those two can get mixed up sometimes with pathos. Remember, like, empathy. Empathy. That's talking about your emotions and that connection that you can make. And ethos is, remember that commercial we watched about all the doctors and nurses from Kaiser? Credibility. Who is the expert? Do they know what they're talking about? Ethics. Ethical. So, uh, the other day, meaning our last synchronous day, I asked you this question. Do you think one of these three, logos, pathos, and ethos, do you think one of these is better than the other? Is one kind of the better option to use in an argument, to use in persuasive writing? We're going to see if we can answer that question, if we can review that and see what it really is. So I want you to imagine that I have been told that I need to convince you, my student, to become a vegetarian. Um, I'm not a vegetarian in real life, but for the sake of this um, activity, just pretend that I am and I'm trying to convince you, I'm trying to persuade you that you should also become a vegetarian. So I want you to look at this argument. You might recognize that this is a syllogism. All animals have feelings just as the human animal does. Factory farming injections and slaughtering are horrible and painful. You should quit eating meat. Here's another argument. The environment should be protected. Cattle raising uses enormous amounts of water, generates massive amounts of waste, and destroys rainforests in South America. You should quit eating meat. Oh look, a third argument. Fat and cholesterol are health hazards and lead to heart problems. Beef and pork have lots of fat and cholesterol. You should quit eating meat. Now, notice um, each one of these arguments has the same conclusion, the same point. You should quit eating meat. That is me trying to convince you to become a vegetarian. And if you notice that each one of these arguments is, is about, you know, um, your diet and anything that has to do with animals, but they focus on different things. And what I want you to notice is that each one of these arguments is totally valid. These are all logical. They make sense. When you, if you were to do the color coding and the breaking down of the syllogisms and looking at the patterns, they all check the mark. They are all valid and logical. So my question to you, which one of these is more convincing to you? Which one makes you go, yeah, you're right. Maybe I should become a vegetarian. Some of you, it might be number one. For some of you, it might be number two. And others, it might be number three. And that's not bad. So I want you to tell me in here, you're going to pause this video. I want you to tell me which argument is most convincing to you specifically. You have to pick one. Which one is the most convincing? And I want you to tell me why. Why did you pick that? Why did that really sell you on why you should become a vegetarian? Go ahead and do that and we'll come back together. Okay, so like I said, I am not expecting that every single person would say that number one or number two. I'm expecting there to be a variety. And the reason for this is because we're going to go back to this question that we asked. Is one, here we go back here. Is one of these greater than another? Should one of these be used more often? Truly, the answer is um, yes, but it depends. And the reason is it all, all, always depends on your audience. You have to know who you are persuading. Who are you talking to? Because if you, let's go back and look at these. If you were talking to, let's say, an environmental activist who really cares about the planet, you could make all three of these arguments to that person, but which one do you think they're really going to care about? 
Number two, you're talking about environmental impacts and how it's harmful for the earth. That is going to sell that person on why they should become a vegetarian. I mean, they probably already are anyway, but that would definitely sell that person. Or maybe you're talking to a doctor or somebody that's in the health and medical field. Number three would probably be more convincing because you're talking about the impact on your health and your body and um, looking at, you know, fat and cholesterol and things like that. So you, I want you to take away from this activity that you have to know your audience. You have to know what they value, what's important to them. All three of these ethos, pathos, and logos might be of value to them. And I would say they should be, but there's always going to be something that they're leaning more towards. So um, let's look at another argument and see how we can test this idea again. So a new topic, convincing, this is you now, not me. You are convincing your grandma to get a smartphone. She does not have one. She maybe has a flip phone or maybe she doesn't even have a cell phone at all, just like a landline. <clears throat> Here's your grandma, so sweet, so kind. And you say, hey, grandma, I really think that you should get a smartphone. And she asks you, well, why? Why should I do that? This could be a possible argument that you give her. Grandma, if you got a smartphone, you could use TikTok. Oh my gosh, Grandma, you got a smartphone. You can use TikTok now. Um, do you think that's going to be very convincing for your grandma? Do you think she's actually going to be like, oh my gosh, you're right, TikTok. I can use TikTok now. No, she's not. She doesn't care about TikTok. Um, this argument would work a lot better. Hey, Grandma, if you got a smartphone, you could FaceTime us. You have a smartphone now. You can FaceTime us. You have to know your audience. I would be very doubtful that your grandma, she might, but maybe not, probably not, is going to care about TikTok. I know it's important to you, most likely, not all of you, but most most of you. Um, but she wants to connect with her family. She wants to see her grandkids. So if you were trying to really, really make an argument, a good argument for her to get a smartphone, I would go with number two because she wants to see you. She wants to be able to talk to you and not just see you on holidays or something like that, especially in a pandemic, right? She could care less about TikTok. She's, she's from a different generation. So this is another example of why knowing your audience matters. You have to know what they value. You have to know the things that are important to them because that will allow you to shift and switch which part of persuasion you are focusing on, whether it's ethos, logos, or pathos. Okay, so now we're going to do an activity to get you more involved in the writing. New topic, you are convincing someone why in-person school is better than distance learning. Here's the syllogism templates for reference. I have one argument. Either distance learning or in-person school will benefit students. Distance learning creates many obstacles for students. Therefore, in-person school is better than distance learning. So this is just one argument. You are going to use the same conclusion that in-person school is better, and I want you to come up with an argument. Tell me you have to come up with two statements that would lead to this conclusion, matching the logic here, that would convince somebody or argue the point that in-person school is better. So go ahead and pause this video and do that. Awesome. All right, let's recap here. Know your audience. Why is it so important to know your audience and what can you do practically to write for your audience? What kind of techniques and tools can you use? I want you to spend time responding to these two questions. So go ahead and pause the video. All right, so lastly, this is the end of um, Synchronous Day 2. This is something that I have linked in the slides, but is also uploaded to Canvas. This um, is actually something that was given to me when I was in college, but it's a article, I guess you could call it, in the form of kind of like a graphic novel, novel or um, comic strips. So. Um, this is a resource for you if you would like to look at it. It's not long and boring. There's many pages to it, but it looks like this on every page with illustrations and dialogue levels. So this is, um, if you are more interested in looking further at ethos, pathos, and logos and rhetoric, you can do that. It might help you, um, but it's on Canvas for you. So that is our 
synchronous day two of week three. If you have any questions, just email me.